Well, it's about um, three minutes after. Seems like our participant numbers have started to stabilize. <laughs> Do you think we should go ahead and get started? Yeah. Sure. Okay, great. Um, well, thank you for being here today and welcome to the third and final in our series of teach-ins, uh, co-sponsored by Case Western Reserve University School of Law and Seattle University School of Law um, and centered around the tragic killing of George Floyd. I'm Jesse Hill, uh, the Judge Ben C. Green Professor of Law and Associate Dean for Research and Faculty Development here at Case Western Law School, um, and I'll be moderating this event. Uh, before I introduce our speakers and begin the program, I would like to begin by asking for eight minutes and 46 seconds of silence in remembrance of George Floyd and all of the other black people wrongfully killed by police in this country. So we'll begin now. <laughs> 
Thank you. Well, um, I would like to then begin um, the program by introducing our subject today, as well as our two esteemed panelists. Um, for those of you who have been following this series, um, you know that the first teach-in focused on the criminal law aspects of uh, the deliberate killing of George Floyd. The second focused on police practices and police reform. This third teach-in in the series will um, focus on constitutional issues and primarily in connection with the response to, the, to police violence. So today we'll be drilling into the legal issues surrounding the protests um, uh, brought about by the George Floyd killing and other similar protests. 
with a focus on the First Amendment and Second Amendment issues involved. Um, and in particular, our panelists will compare uh, the, the Black Lives Matter protests with the COVID-19 stay home protests and discuss the ways in which free speech and the right to bear arms were implicated and intersected uh, in those uh, two kinds of protests or those various kinds of protests really. So let me begin that or let me move on to introducing our panelists. Our first panelist, Brian Adamson, um, is a graduate of Case Western Law School and its incoming Associate Dean of Diversity and Inclusion, as well as uh, the David L. Brennan Professor of Law. Immediately after graduating from Case Law, Brian practiced in the litigation department of Squire Patton Boggs, um, which was then Squire Sanders and Dempsey, and as an assistant prosecutor for Cuyahoga County. Prior to moving to Seattle, Brian was a case law professor for seven years, during which he also served uh, for four years as assistant dean for student services. He arrives from Seattle University School of Law, where he has served as its director of clinical programs. And uh, Brian's areas of expertise are mass media and First Amendment law, and he has practiced extensively in housing, mortgage lending, and consumer protection law. Uh, he teaches the course Protest Policing in the First Amendment, as well as Mass Media Law and Policy, and also Civil Procedure. Um, his scholarship has addressed issues of race, criminal justice, constitutional law, and media law, and he has been published in the Harvard Journal on Racial and Ethnic Justice, the Alabama uh, Civil Rights and Civil Liberties Law Review, the Journal of Civil Rights and Economic Development, um, on those topics as, as well as in many other journals and publications. Um, our second speaker, Jonathan Adler, is the Johan Verhey, <laughs> I never know if I'm pronouncing it right, Memorial Professor of Law he, um, at Case Western Reserve University School of Law and the director of its uh, Coleman P. Burke Center for Environmental Law. He teaches courses in environmental, administrative, and constitutional law. Uh, Jonathan is the author or editor of seven books um, and over a dozen book chapters. His articles have appeared in publications ranging from the Harvard Environmental Law Review and Yale Journal on, Public, on Regulation um, to the Wall Street Journal and USA Today. He has testified before Congress a dozen times and his work has been cited in the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, a 2016 study uh, identified Professor Adler as the most cited legal academic in administrative and environmental law under age 50. Um, a regular commentator on constitutional and regulatory issues, he has also appeared on numerous radio and television programs, ranging from the PBS NewsHour with Jim Lehrer and NPR's Talk of the Nation to the Fox News Channel and Entertainment Tonight. Um, and in 2018, uh, Jonathan was elected to membership of the American Law Institute. So um, we are very lucky to have both of these panelists with us today. And um, I am gonna now sort of back out and give, um, well, I'm gonna give our, I, I'm, and I'm gonna guide the conversation with some questions for our panelists. I'm gonna give them an opportunity to do um, uh, some talking on the topic of First Amendment and Second Amendment uh, law and its intersection with protest. Um, I just wanna mention there will be I hope ample time for Q&A at the end of this session. And um, the best way, since this is a webinar format, the best way to submit your questions would be by clicking on the Q&A box down at the, it's normally at the bottom of your screen. Um, and you can actually feel free to type questions during the remarks if you want, or you can wait till the end. Um, and the, the questions will then be um, moderated and asked to the, the panelists. Um, oh, there is also apparently a way to um, upvote the, uh, the question. So if you see a question that um, you wanted to ask or that you'd like to hear the answer to in particular, you can, I think it's a thumbs up or something like that, but you can indicate that and it'll move the question up in the, the um, order. Okay, 
So um, I want to kind of start with sort of a broad question, asking you both um, to give an overview of the relevant First and Second Amendment principles um, that arise out of the demonstration. Again, we're kind of thinking about, on the one hand, the demonstrations arising out of the George Floyd killing. On the other hand, we could um, think about the, the demonstrations arising out of the COVID-19 stay home orders. And um, I guess maybe I'll ask Professor um, Adamson to speak first about the um, First Amendment principles and then um, uh, Professor Adler can jump in or, or, or mm -hmm. take it away on the Second Amendment. So yeah. okay. go ahead. Cool, all right, all right. thank you very much, Jesse. Um, and thank you all for being here, especially thank uh, Jonathan and Jesse for um, agreeing to, to have this conversation. Um, also thank you to the interpreters um, and, and especially thank you um, Claudine, um, for all of the te technical and logistical assistance that you're providing us. Um, and uh, so I wanted to just sort of jump things off with uh, framing some of the uh, uh, topics that we're gonna discuss in the next hour or so um, and um, in, in, in First Amendment terms. And so I'm gonna go to my share screen here and begin to share, all right. Um, now, um, Jonathan, Jesse, can you see this screen? Everyone, I assume everybody can see the screen here. So I'm just gonna talk, I'm gonna lay out some of the um, First Amendment issues and principles that are at play with regards to the protests and the responses uh, to George Floyd um, killing, as well as murder, as well as um, some of the Second Amendment issues, or I'm sorry, as well as the COVID-19 lo lockdown um, protests and, um, and then hand it over to Jonathan, who will sort of elaborate and, 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 and also bring in some of the Second Amendment principles at issue. Um, and many of us may be very familiar with this language with regards to the First Amendment. That is this, this idea that Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the um, uh, free exercise thereof, bridging the freedom of speech, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is where we start off. And, um, and understanding and appreciating the fact that uh, that within, within the First Amendment, there are basically five freedoms that we typically talk about. Religion, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, press assembly, and to petition one's govern, govern, government for a redress of grievances. Um, so right now, our primary concern for purposes of this conversation, of course, are um, really the, the, the four, the speech, press, assembly, and petition um, freedoms that are established in the um, First Amendment. Uh, as many of us know, as many of you probably already know that there's a, the First Amendment protects a broad range, a host of, of speech and speech acts and speech activity um, and, and prohibits the the federal government from infringing upon those rights. Now, the First Amendment, the federal First Amendment applies to the states through the due process clause of the 14th Amendment. And so um, the First Amendment um, restrictions um, do apply not just to the federal government, but also to um, states from infringing upon those freedoms. Uh, there's, um, and while the First Amendment is pretty broad in terms of the type of speech and acts and expression and performances that are protected, there are some that are not protected. Um, uh, and I just list, we just list those here. The knowing lie, there's an exception to that in a second I'll, I'll get to. The knowing lie, like um, perjury uh, or fraud, um, that is not protected speech. Uh, however, um, to make a representation about one's affiliation to with, with the military or military service is protected. Um, under the Stolen Valor Act, um, and that's, um, that's one, one exception um, to the knowing lie. Um, libel and slander, in other words, defamation, um, is also a type of speech that we have decided, uh, or and the Supreme Court has affirmed, is not absolute, is not protected. Obscenity, um, fighting words, um, clear and pre present danger, or words or expressions or acts that create a clear and present danger, of, of, of violence and harm, uh, incitement, incitement to imminent law, lawless action, and then true threats. 
that type of speech, those types of expressions, that type of performance of speech acts um, can be um, prescribed by the um, First Amendment or under the First Amendment or as, as exceptions to the First Amendment. Um, some of the cases that animate some of those concepts um, are listed here on Toplinski versus New Hampshire, where basically the court held that the First Amendment doesn't protect Biden words, you know, which are those words, quote unquote, inherently, that inherently cause or are likely to result in immediate disturbance. Um, those considered words are, are, are considered, those types of words are considered offensive, even if they don't provoke a fight. Um, uh, in that particular case, the, uh, the speaker, Chaplinsky, was calling the um, city marshal uh, a goddamn racketeer and a damn fascist. And the court um, upheld uh, the fact that um, th those words were not protected uh, under the First Amendment. Uh, there's also this clear and present danger test. You know, when words are used in such a manner to, or circumstances that are such a nature to create a clear and present danger that there is some type of um, lawless action that will take place. Um, in the particular case that animates that principle, um, there, there the issue was the distribution of draft circulars. Um, and in 19, and uh, with, re with respect to World War I. Um, and um, those, the distribution of those draft or anti-draft circulars were seen as um, violating the Espionage Act. And the Supreme Court upheld um, Schenck's conviction under that act. Um, incitement uh, is another specific type of uh, speech or performance of speech act that is not protected under the First Amendment. Uh, and there are a lot of nuances to this particular principle, um, but it was, a, it was first sort of really established in, in Brandenburg versus Ohio. Um, and in that particular case, uh, man had organized, a member of the KKK had organized um, a KKK rally and made some statements with regards to taking action against the federal government um, asking for the expulsion or demanding that the, of the expulsion of Jews and, and black folks from the United States, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And he was convicted under um, an Ohio statute that prohibited um, that type of, type of advocacy. Um, and that the Supreme Court in that particular case ruled that the, uh, that the statute in Ohio was unconstitutional. And it was there that they, they advanced this issue or this, um, the principle of incitement to imminent lawless action, where they say that speech is protected except under those cases where the incitement is probable to express, is probable, probably expressing or advocating violence, and that it advocates immediate violence and it relates to violence likely to to incur or likely to occur. And so, um, so it's, it's helpful to sort of put that principle in context when we talk about what types of speech, um, when speech can be stopped, when speech can be suppressed. Um, true threats and um, true threats and hate speech um, were animated or at issue in um, Virginia versus Black and RIV versus City of St. Paul that talks about, that basically says that um, certain particular, certain types of um, statements or expressions um, can only be prescribed when they elicit or they amount to a true threat um, to a specific um, target. Um, also, um, in the context of talking about First Amendment, it's important to uh, counterpose those, those First Amendment rights to police powers of the states. And the notion that um, for the purposes of protecting the health, safety, and welfare of a, a community, a city, a state, a polity, that there are certain police powers that are possessed by the United States, um, um, by, 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 by the state governments. And they can enforce and enact certain restrictions uh, and put certain conditions on the ex exercise of, of speech. Um, one of those conditions is time, place, manner restrictions. 
That is to say that a, a local or state federal government can, can place time, place and manner restrictions on the expression or the performance um, of, of, of protests or demonstrations, for example, requiring a license, requiring a permit, um, restricting the times of day that, uh, that certain speech can take place by restricting, for example, where speech might take place. Um, the other principle uh, under the First Amendment that comes up uh, and will come up and does come up in this case, and we've seen it um, certainly in the last couple of weeks, is this um, concept or the principle of the heckler's veto. Um, the notion that uh, the government should above all protect the speech of the speakers. Um, even if that speech is unpopular, even if there's audience members in within range of that speech who are behaving in a hostile manner toward the speaker. Um, when there is a peaceful speaker whose message is protected by the First Amendment, when that speaker is confronted by a hostile crowd, um, the heckler's veto states that a state may not silence the speaker as an expedient alternative to containing or snuffing out the rioting individuals, their lawless behavior. Um, so those are um, some of the uh, some of the ideas, some of the principles that undergird um, what we're going to be talking today about, um, talking more about. Um, Jonathan, I'll hand it to you now. Anything to add? Uh, you're muted. There we go. All righty. Sorry about that. First. Um, uh, I want to thank uh, Brian and Claudine and everyone for putting this together. Um, it's always great to be um, a part of these uh, programs, although uh, obviously the, the impetus for this program or the inspiration for this program is is something that we all uh, that that we all regret. But it's it's important to be able to talk about the legal issues that um, uh, frame uh, what we're going through. Um, I want to briefly for for the moment just say a little bit about the Second Amendment. Um, and contrast that with the First Amendment in a few in a few ways, and then I know Brian and I are going to talk uh, talk about some of the tensions and conflicts that are buried within uh, the relevant doctrine. So, um, Second Amendment is second. I uh, just as a, as an initial historical matter, the First Amendment is first. The Second Amendment is second by accident. Um, they actually were not proposed uh, as the first and second. They were merely the first and second to have been ratified. Uh, by uh, by the states um, uh, as part of the Bill of Rights. So we shouldn't assume that they are in rank order. Um, uh, they The first is first, the second is second, the third is third. Mm. The prohibition on quartering troops in your home, um, that's not the third most important right in our constitution. <laughs> um, the Second Amendment, as I think as folks you. know, um, uh, hopefully the Third Amendment is not particularly relevant to our current conversation and remain. <laughs> but, yeah. um, the Second Amendment uh, provides that a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. And, and as we all know, the Second Amendment uh, relates to guns and gun ownership and throughout our history has had a uh, intricate relationship with both the idea about the rights of people to defend themselves uh, and has also been related to protest and in particular protest against the government. Um, one air thing that makes the second amendment very different from the first amendment is that we have dozens upon dozens upon dozens of cases explicating the contours of the right to speech and the right to, pro, uh, to right to the freedom of the press and the right to peaceably assemble. We don't have dozens upon dozens of Supreme Court cases going back decades on the Second Amendment. As a practical matter, we have two. Uh, two Supreme Court cases that answer a little bit, which I will summarize very quickly and briefly, and then I will note some of what's left open uh, and say a little bit about um, what the history might suggest about how to think about the Second Amendment in this context. So uh, in a case called District of Columbia versus Heller, the Supreme Court concluded that the Second Amendment protects a pre-existing right 
to self-defense that at the very least encompasses the right to own a handgun within the home. And there are a couple of things that are, that are worth packing, uh, unpacking. Um, first is the court concluded that the Second Amendment's reference to the right not being infringed meant that the right was a pre-existing natural right. And the idea there is that free people have the right to defend themselves. And part of that is the ability to protect themselves against threats, including ultimately uh, the threat of tyrannical government. Uh, the second thing that the court said is that at the very least, that entails the right to common firearms, firearms in common use in the home. Uh, and in, in District of Columbia versus Heller, the court didn't say a lot more than that, other than to say that to understand the scope of the right, we have to think and look very carefully at the way the right at issue has been understood throughout our history. In a subsequent case, McDonald versus Chicago, the Supreme Court held the Second Amendment like the other rights, or almost all of the other rights uh, enumerated in the Bill of Rights is incorporated against the states through the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. Uh, and so that it applies against the state of Washington, it, it applies against the state of Ohio, and by extension, it applies against uh, local jurisdictions, uh, cities and townships and the like. And there in McDonald, the court reiterated that the, the inquiry is one looking at, at history and how the right was understood. One thing the court also noted in McDonald uh, is that um, when we think about what rights are protected as against state action as opposed to federal action, uh, there's actually a strong argument that the Second Amendment was explicitly and consciously one of the rights that the drafters of the 14th Amendment wanted to protect uh, against a state action. If one looks at the various statutes passed by the Reconstruction Congress, uh, the Freedmen Bureau Act and others, uh, we, one sees repeated reference to the right of self-defense uh, and the right of free people and especially uh, freed slaves, now free, uh, free citizens of the United States to own guns as an element of their citizenship. In fact, if one looks at, at the at Justice Tawney's infamous decision in Dred Scott, one of the arguments Justice Tawney makes for saying that blacks could not be citizens is because he says that would mean they would be the right, would have the right to arm themselves. And, if, and Justice Tawney thought that was absurd. Um, the Reconstruction Con uh, Congress agreed with Justice Tawney that the right to citizenship meant the right to defend yourself. Uh, and throughout the period of Reconstruction, some of the early history of gun control uh, in the United States was the effort by Southern states, but not exclusively Southern states, uh, to disarm free Blacks uh, so that they would be at the mercy of, of uh, state violence uh, and white militias. Uh, I think that history is important um, because it, it, it shows a commonality between the Second Amendment and the First Amendment as both being at least in part recognized as rights that are essential to protect groups that don't have political power. And that groups that do not have political power need the ability to speak, to have voice, to challenge uh, those that may be oppressing them, but also ultimately uh, need the power to be able to defend themselves. Uh, obviously that latter part is one that sometimes makes us uneasy. Uh, we don't like violence. Um, uh, but the Second Amendment in our history has been recognized as, like the First Amendment, one way of, of checking, uh, of checking uh, uh, state power uh, and has been understood that way as inherent in the right of citizenship. The precise limits of that, and this is the, the point I'll close with for, for now, is, is a bit unclear. McDonald and Heller both dealt with individuals who wanted to have handguns in the home so they could protect themselves from intruders, uh, from criminals. Um, we do not have a Supreme Court case about carrying outside of the home. Uh, Washington State, Ohio are both states where open carry is allowed. Uh, states, uh, uh, I know in Ohio and I believe in Washington State as well, uh, you can get a permit for concealed carry. Uh, and certainly that's true in, in much of the United States. But we don't have a Supreme Court decision, for example, saying that states must allow open carry. Uh, 
must allow concealed carry permits for individuals that meet certain requirements, uh, nor do we have much in the way of what sorts of uh, arms are encompassed by those rights. The Supreme Court actually had 10 cert petitions pending this term that it could have used to help clarify these, these cases, uh, and it denied all of them. And then another case this past term uh, involving um, the ability to transport uh, a lawfully owned firearm was rendered moot when the law in question was repealed. So we don't know a lot precisely about at least what the Supreme Court thinks about the contours of these rights. Um, but we do know that the, that the Second Amendment protects a right that is incorporated against the state and that the Supreme Court has said is fundamental uh, under the 14th Amendment and must be treated as such. But whether that means it will be subject to First Amendment-like limitations or some other a set of tests is something we're, we're still trying to figure out. Great, thank you. Um, so I guess maybe to move on to the next sort of piece of understanding the legal principles here, could you each talk a little bit about which um, First Amendment and Second Amendment principles are kind of in play and even coming into conflict here? I mean, to the extent that there, that we do know I guess, um, the scope of the Second Amendment. I think with the First Amendment, maybe it's a little more, um, you know, th there are more principles to draw on, but. Sure, I think we said I was gonna start on this one. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah, there are principles to draw on, but there are tensions. And I think if one just starts with, with some of the First Amendment uh, doctrines that Brian uh, pointed out, when we start to pull on some of them, we can see that they lead us in directions that may be in, in conflict with one, with one another. Um, so for example, um, we protect speech because it matters, because it has power. Um, we also sometimes want to restrict speech because it has power. And so a lot of First Amendment doctrine is tr about trying to figure out precisely where we draw that line. Right now, we draw that line in a very speech protective place. Doctrines like incitement and fighting words um, typically are understood to be about someone getting in your face, directing language at you. Um, uh, speech acts and, 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 and speech conduct that makes uh, the, the opportunity for counter speech as a way of challenging that speech inoperative, right? Incitement is being the sort of speech that is gonna cause someone to react viscerally. Um, fighting words, the sort of thing, I mean, I'm not sure about the, the language that was at issue in Shank. I don't, I don't think if I uh, 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 called someone a syndicalist or, or, or corrupt, uh, I would be provoking violence. But we can all think of words, phrases, actions, uh, or words and phrases that if said in the face of another person, and said, if said in the face of a protester, said in the face of a police officer, might provoke a visceral response. And, um, in the context of protests, that creates an interesting, difficult line um, uh, that, that is, is, bare, is within First Amendment doctrine and one we have to think about. Another tension I wanted to, to highlight that I think relates a lot to protest is we have a right to speak. We have a right to peaceably assemble. The word peaceably is actually there in the First Amendment. We also know that protest and certain types of speech are most powerful and most effective when they are disruptive, when they make people uncomfortable. Uh, yet the doctrine also says that the government is allowed to do things like impose time, place, and manner restrictions, is allowed to prevent protesters from say blocking traffic, preventing egress down the street, require permits in certain situations, you know, allow those that don't wanna be involved in the protest to go about their daily lives. And I think there's a tension there too, because we all know that protest is often about trying to get our fellow citizens to wake up, uh, to, it is about trying to disrupt their going about their day in the normal way. Um, and so there, there, there is a, a tension in, on the one hand, the doctrine that tries to say, you're allowed to speak, but we're also allowed to confine it, contain it. Uh, and, and that containment and that containment and that confinement necessarily 
may dampen it, may uh, inhibit its its uh, ability to um, uh, cause the sort of discomfort that is often so integral in the sort of civil protest that we see as as being important in the First Amendment. And I and I think that's a tension. We I think we could all identify examples of of that sort of tension. Um, uh, one that, that I think about um, because we have a good number of cases about it is there are all sorts of cases about protests in Washington, D.C., especially around inaugurations. The Park Service gives the inauguration committee by, by, by regulation the best spot for their bleachers. And groups that want to protest have to compete with other folks for where they want to protest. Well, obviously, if you're protesting the inauguration of the president, you want to be along that parade route. You want to be there in the vision and in, within the hearing of the people that are celebrating that president, perhaps the president themselves. Um, but yet, we have decided that inauguration is something that has to proceed in, in, in a sort of normal way. Um, and uh, my own view is, is the courts have been a little too solicitous of of inaugurations and and that um, and not uh, solicitous enough of the fact that there are always those that lose an election and, and want their voices heard. Um, but there's a tension there. Uh, you know, how do you administer that process, that ceremony, uh, and also allow uh, discordant voices? Um, and and I think when you get into those details, it sometimes gets more difficult than than just a superficial description of the doctrine would suggest. Thanks. Yeah, I, and I think we'll get into a little bit more about how these principles kind of play out um, in the current controversies, the current protest context. But I want to give um, Brian a chance to either add to that, to those remarks, or if you want to talk a little bit about the Second Amendment sort of tensions. Yeah, yeah I, I do want to. Um... I want to start with the Second Amendment and First Amendment tensions, and then um, go to some other things that um, come to mind in, 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 in listening to um, Jonathan. Uh, the the obvious tension, not the obvious tension, but one obvious tension um, with regards to the First Amendment and Second Amendment is the expressive act of that the First Amendment ensures with the performative and expressive act that the Second Amendment ensures and what happens when um, those two rights um, potentially clash. So for example, it, it, under First Amendment doctrine, it is very clear that um, one can protest, one can engage in a demonstration while having brandishing, owning, having possessing a gun or some other type of firearm. Right, um, and that is that is something that is that is that is pretty clear. Um, the tensions arise, however, when one, say, an opposing group, is exercising their rights to bear arms, while the other group is exercising their right to free speech, uh, without, for example, with minimal arms in their possession. What does that do with regards to the chilling effect? Does does the um, do the people who are the counter protesters, for example, um, is the fact that they are bearing arms chill the speech of those who are exercising their First Amendment rights? Does it make them? Uh, is it intimidating to them? Um, where do you strike the balance between? allowing respective groups to exercise their respective rights. Um, and I think that's one of the areas that where, where, the, where the tension um, comes in. The others, I think, have to do with how uh, officers and officials respond to disruptive speech, the, the in-your-face speech. Um, what are their duties and obligations when uh, when the subject, when the subject matter, when the topic of the demonstration um, of, the, of the grievance is police conduct and police misconduct, right? Um, where they and their power, they, they're being directly challenged, their power is being directly challenged. How they respond to that challenge 
is something that I think um, deserves to um, be unpacked. And we'll, we'll unpack that in a little bit when we talk about militarization and the ways in which um, black grievance and black protest has been treated. I think, I think finally, what, uh, what courses through all of this um, that we're talking about is this, is this principle of content neutrality. Um, that is to say that the government cannot favor or disfavor a particular type of expression, particular type of protest, particular type of demonstration, a particular type of speech act because of the content of it. Um, and that is something that, um, that courts constantly grapple with. That is something, of course, that, that local municipalities have to constantly grapple with and ensure that they are not to the extent that they are um, imposing certain restrictions on speech or the right to bear arms, for example, that it is that they're doing so in a content neutral way. There, you know, there are other important principles that go along with that in terms of advancing a significant governmental interest and being narrowly tailored to policies and rules that are being um, followed. Um, uh, and and so those are things. Those are, that's the thing that's often in tension. And we see it in tension with the Seattle, um, Seattle case, the recent Seattle case where um, um, Judge Jones in the Black Lives Matter case versus the city of Seattle basically held, um, upheld a temporary restraining order, or I should say imposed a temporary restraining order um, um, on the use of the, on the city's use of tear gas and other types of non-lethal responses to the Black Lives Matter protests. We'll get into that a little bit more as well. But there was a clear example where the, you have the tensions between public safety and health and the right to peaceably protest. So I'll leave it right there for now. Great, thanks. So, um, so yeah, well maybe that's a good moment to sort of transition into talking a little more specifically about what has been happening um, in terms of these protests, sort of um, both police responses and state responses to to the various forms of protest, and have they been different? Um, have, you know, so so I guess maybe we could start with um, well, we could start with either one, but I guess like what what have been sort of the responses in the states to these various um, kinds of protests? I guess Brian, do you want to since you were starting to talk about it? Do you yeah, wanna, I'll, I'll yeah. continue to thank you. Um, one of the things that is, I think is important for us to really grapple with and, and get our heads around is the militarization of the police. And to finally begin to ask the questions about as to whether or not this just needs to be wholesale dismantled. Um, and for a whole host of reasons, um, not, a, not, not the least of which um, is the differential ways in which the disparate ways in which um, police have elected to use that military equipment um, and who they elected to use it against. Um, you know, the, these, um, the Department of De Defense um, has this program called the 1033 program. And that 1023 program has been around, um, I, I believe at least since 1989. And it allows for law enforcement agencies to receive military hardware that includes vehicles for land, sea, or air, night vision goggles, ballistic helmets, tactical vests, televisions, cameras, computers, um, even camping gear. All right. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of background about this and um, this this particular rule or this particular program. Now, the jurisdictions, the police departments, the cities can find this equipment either by browsing online or shopping, um, shopping, actually physically shopping at a location where the equipment is stored, the military equipment is stored. Um, some statistics, and I got to give a shout out to my former colleague, Corinna Rahal, who did a wonderful article on, these, on this particular program. And so I'm citing and using some of her, her data in this. Um, since that program's inception, it has dispersed property valued at more than $5.1 billion, including $450 million in 2013 alone. Um, over 11,000, that is to say more specifically, 11,500 domestic law enforcement agencies 
take part in the 1033 program. Um, but the program doesn't provide any police department, any regulatory oversight in how they use that military equipment, right? And um, armed personnel carriers, those big tanks that you see, um, that's a stark example of how police departments are not looking more like military, but they're acting like small armies by bringing in this type of equipment, right? Um, this is equipment that was used in the Afghanistan and Iraq wars, right? And they're basically being repurposed to be put on our streets um, and um, for SWAT teams and then for police, uh, police departments. Um, and even those police departments don't have clear policies or guidelines on when and under what circumstances are they going to use that military equipment, right? Um, and typically, it's my understanding that a, a, a jurisdiction that has that equipment has to use it within a year or give it back. So they, they try to find a way to use the equipment in any event, right? Um, but you also see, it's not just cities like Seattle and, and, and Cleveland that have this equipment. Um, small towns has this, have, has this type of equipment as well. Um, some examples, Roanoke Rapids in North Carolina has a population of 16,000, but they've got Humvees and a mine resistant ambush protected vehicle. They got that in 2013. Fairmount, Georgia, which has 7,000 people. The police department acquired over 17,000 items through the 1033 program. Bloomington, Georgia has only 2,700 re residents and it's got four grenade launchers. Tupelo, Mississippi has a population of 35,000 and they got a free helicopter that cost about $20,000 a year to maintain. Um, and you think about it, you know, how absurd these no that, that notion is with this equipment, with regards to this equipment. Um, but importantly, once that equipment is used and the circumstances under which that uh, equipment can, is used is inherently troubling because of the racialized way in which it seems to be being deployed. Um, we see, and history is, and research has borne this out, that police officers and police departments tend to react and respond differently to protests that are led by Blacks or involve or entail Black causes. For example, um, research was done Oh, um, looking at about 15,000 protests over a period from 1960 to 1990, 30 years, granted some, some, some severe issues during that period of time. In that research and looking at the research, um, I'm sorry, and looking at those protests, you know, the researchers were asking themselves whether or not there was some differential way in which um, these places were, or these protests were police, right? Asking themselves, when you controlled for race or you control for everything else, would it race play a part in how they were protest, um, um, how they were policed, right? Um, and they found that it was, right? That um, protests we all know that are typically considered threatening to actors who are charged making specific protest situations uh, and protest situations. And we also know that um, police officers and police systems usually use the threat of the criminal justice system um, or the actual criminal justice system um, and they deploy it as control mechanism. And like I say, they looked at over a 30 year period to determine whether otherwise equally threatening protest events are more likely to be police when there are African American participants present and to learn that whether once at an event, police treated African-Americans and white protesters differently. And what they concluded was that not only were black protesters more likely to draw police presence, the police once present were more likely to make arrests, use force and violence and the like, right? And so this tells you some really, or this raises some really troubling issues, particularly when you talk about militarization where the militarization of the police itself creates an enhanced situation of, of conflict 
um, of, 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 of threat where the protesters are not just looking at looking like people who they are bound to serve and protect, but they are now the enemy. And the police are treating them as the enemy down to what they are wearing and down to their armament. And the fact of the matter is that those, that armament, that militarization can also escalate tensions and conflicts between the protesters and between the police. We've seen that time and time again. We've seen that time and time again over the last several months. And so that's one of the things that's, um, that's very problematic, uh, one of the many things, but that especially is problematic about what we're seeing today um, with regards to uh, these protests. And that is the, how the police have responded and what they have used to, to respond um, to, those, um, to those protests. Um, I should say before I, I turn it over to John too that um, this was also a part of what's, what happened with um, um, the tragic death of Breonna Taylor, right? These no-knock warrants and militarization that creates the responses um, that they do in people who are, <laughs> who are basically sleeping at home um, and, and to be killed um, by, um, by law enforcement. Um, using this great, this military grade equipment and a no knock warrants. So I'll hand it over to you for now, Larry. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, well, let me just jump in and just say, I think that the, um, you know, the, the statistics or the data you gave us about um, the differential treatment of uh, protests by Black people, like it definitely was sort of. Um, borne out by what seems to have happened. And maybe you want to talk a little bit about that, um, Jonathan, when you observed the um, armed protesters who marched on the Capitol in Lansing, Michigan, right? Um, mm -hmm. The white protesters who um, did not seem to have any trouble, you know, from the, the police um, versus how, what the response has been to the Black Lives Matter um, protests around George Floyd and, and other um, killings. So uh, maybe, yeah. Yeah, a couple of things. Um, and I want to mention one other kind of legal threat to, to protesting as, as well. Um, so certainly, uh, the insofar as there aren't clear standards for how police departments are to evaluate the actual threat that a peaceful protest becomes something else, um, that invites the use of discretion. And it should be no surprise that if we let police have discretion, that sometimes that discretion is going to be used in bad ways. Um, and most simply, um, if the police are, and police conduct is what is being protested, um, and police are allowed to just sim simply use their own discretion about how to respond to that protest, which should not surprise us that the police are more hostile to protests that they see as against them um, uh, and, and less hostile to other protests. There are, there are anecdotal reports, uh, for example, out of, of Philadelphia, to use one example of my, my, my hometown, where the police sent, essentially turned a, a blind eye to armed groups of what they saw as pro-police or anti-Black Lives Matter uh, protesters um, and were not so... Um, uh, passive with regard to the Black Lives Matter protesters. And that that's clearly a problem. Um, and uh, if we are to have a system in which people are allowed to protest, and most importantly, protest the way their government is treating them, then we need to ensure that the police have standards that guide how they evaluate what sort of reaction is necessary to what sort of protest that is independent of the conduct or, or sorry, independent of the content of that protest. The second point that, that Brian's comments make that I think is important for us to remember is that, you know, how the police respond to protests itself has communicative content. And it's communicative content that matters and that can have an effect on how police conduct is perceived, uh, have an effect on how people perceive whether they are in fact allowed to protest peacefully and will they, whether they will be heard peacefully. There's a difference between being met by police officers in their normal day-to-day uh, you know, -day uniforms, 
um, uh, standing there with their with their hands out uh, versus the line of plastic shields and riot gear versus uh, police in their full militarized getup, right? And and it should not surprise us if that if if the message that police send to different protesters and different groups has an effect on what follows, and and the police should need to be sensitive to that. There's a whole bunch of resor research that suggests the more police engage in conduct that has the effect of distancing themselves from those that they are sworn to serve and protect, that alienates them and distances them from, from those communities, the more they are perceived as an oppositional force uh, and, and the more that engenders conflict. And so that affects not just how free people feel to be able to protest, but it also, for lots of reasons we understand, affects the way those protests may manifest themselves, the extent to which people feel they can be heard through civil peaceful protest versus uh, taking other sorts of actions. And, and here in Cleveland, there's, there's been some discussion of the fact that uh, there was not a lot of disruption uh, after uh, the Tamir Rice killing. Um, mm -hmm. There was not a lot of disruption at the Republican convention. Um, there was tremendous disruption more recently uh, uh, with the George Floyd uh, protests. And apparently, um, the police adopted different approaches in the first two context, uh, uh, contexts than in the more recent one. Um, there's still efforts to diagnose precisely what what those differences were and why. Uh, but we know a lot that how the police respond to protests can affect whether or not those protests remain peaceful, whether or not people feel uh, they have an equal right to be heard. The, the other thing I wanted to mention, which, which um, uh, Brian and I wanted to make sure we brought up is there are other ways in which the law can pose a threat to peaceful protest. And there's a case that's actually um, a, a, a petition for certiorari, a, a request for the Supreme Court to hear a case is pending now. It will be, it's scheduled to be considered at the end of the summer uh, involving uh, a Black Lives Matter a protest uh, from uh, Louisiana. Uh, in July 2016, uh, some folks may remember the case of Alton Sterling in Baton Rouge, uh, who was killed by police. Uh, in the wake of that killing, uh, there were there were protests um, organized in part by some of the, the, the Black Lives Matter groups. And uh, according to at least uh, the claim in a lawsuit that was filed, is that the protests uh, got a little bit unruly and a, a protester threw a rock that hit a, a, a police officer in the head and, and caused an injury. And so that police officer sued, but he didn't sue the rock thrower. He rather sued DeRay McKesson, who uh, some viewers may be familiar with, and the organizers of the protests, saying they were negligent in organizing and encouraging the protest and should have foreseen that this protest would have led to somebody getting upset and eventually throwing a rock. And the U.S. Uh, the district court dismissed this case, saying, "Well, no, you you don't. You can you can sue the guy that threw the rock. You can't sue someone that organized a protest because that may have inspired someone else to behave in an unlawful uh, way. Uh, but especially since there was no there was no incitement claim. This was a negligence claim. But the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit reinstated the case and." Um, and so what that essentially means is that you organize a protest and it's about an issue that really moves people, that people are really upset about, about which there are raw feelings. Under the Fifth Circuit's decision, you as organizing that protest could have to defend yourself in a tort suit for negligence, for uh, having created the environment in which someone might have crossed the, the line from permissible speech to uh, violent action. Um, it's a very problematic decision. It's one that that the Supreme Court will hopefully um, will hopefully do something about. And it, it raises an issue that we've seen before. There's a famous Supreme Court case called Claiborne Hardware, uh, where uh, there was uh, an effort to 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 boycott stores that that were uh, uh, segregated stores and that were not supporting civil rights. And there was an effort to sue the NAACP for organizing the the boycotts and claiming in part that the boycotts, the existence of the boycotts inspired some individuals to 
uh, engage in violent behavior as a means of enforcement. Uh, but the suit wasn't against the people that engaged in violence. It was against the people that wanted to organize peaceful boycott. And the Supreme Court in Claiborne Hardware said, no, you can't do that because that's too much of a threat to peaceful activity, to peaceful protest, to encouraging people to choose how they spend their money as a way of advancing social change. Uh, I would argue, the, uh, and the petitioners in, in the McKesson case certainly argue that that principle should mean you can't, a police officer who gets hit with a rock can't sue the organizer of the protest. Um, and, and hopefully the Supreme Court sees that, but this is a case that's worth paying attention to uh, because it highlights how other legal doctrines, if we don't, if we don't pay attention to how they're being applied, can actually pose a threat to, to peaceful protest uh, of the sort that we're seeing today. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, it's a fascinating case, definitely one to watch. Also, sort of ironic how, you know, in that context, the sort of organizers of a movement can seemingly be held responsible for the actions of one individual who kind of you know does something improper but presumably on their own without being told to and without being incited to do that and then you know you think about the problem of holding police officers accountable where they are very much in a sort of structured um, organization where there should be policies in place where their conduct should be controlled so that they're not mm -hmm. um, causing violence and it's very hard to hold not just the officers but even harder to hold the entire department or the municipality responsible for you know it, it becomes a, a, a bad apples right claim right, right, or problem right, in that context right, whereas right. you know so it's to me that's particularly ironic but i i want to give um brian a chance i think we want to move soon to today, but i want to give brian a chance to talk a little bit pick up on those legal um, issues and responses that we've been yeah, seeing and yeah I think it's a good place to also raise um, um, Judge Jones's response to what's happened in Seattle here with regard to the tear gassing of peaceful protesters um, and, and the importance of appreciating the line that has to be drawn here where um, the police are trying to protect property safety, not only for others, but for themselves. But, um, but in the meantime, you have people who are not engaging in violent acts. And so this notion of the indiscriminate use of non-lethal uh, material, tear gas, the rubber bullets, it's just beyond the pale and out of the question. And that's basically the, the, the line that um, Judge Jones drew. And I think it's, a, uh, I think it's important and a, and a really vital line to draw. Um, shout out to the people here, some of my friends and colleagues who, who brought that case and, 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 and are, are prosecuting that case. Um, there, there's been a host of ways in which um, they, we have historically tried to police protests. And I want to go through those now and give a few examples of, of, of some current events before we, um, before we close out. Let me, let me get to these here now. Uh -oh. uh, let me go and see if I can go to screen sharing again. I should say before we close out with questions and responses. Let me see here. So some of the, these are some of the common ways in which police and police officers have res respond to um, conduct in the, in the context of um, protests. And these are Washington statutes. I didn't do the counter counterpart um, Ohio statutes. But these are some of the wa Washington statutes that we that commonly arise when uh, there's, um, there's police responding to criminal behavior, allegedly criminal behavior in the context of protest. But what we're seeing now is throughout the country, primarily in response to Standing Rock, primarily in response to Black Lives Matter movement and protests, are this, this spate of anti-protest laws that at the end of the day are seeking to chill, to chill speech by making it cost the protesters to engage in that type of speech. One example being what Jonathan, the one, the McKesson case that Jonathan just talked about. Some very troubling cases or tr very troubling laws that are, that are popping up throughout the, um, um, throughout the country 
on these on these particular issues that are direct responses to objecting to the movement and the message of the movement. Um, so it's, these are some things worth looking into. Um, but I'm going to close on this reminder that none of this is necessarily necessary by accident, especially in the context of black claims and black claims making and and the policing of black bodies. Um, the policing of black bodies has been going on since 1619, since, since um, Africans were brought over in slave ships, that there have been laws um, or policies or rules sought to control um, black bodies, primarily because um, being fearful of uprisings and slave revol revolts. You know, so you had um, the requirement, you had slave patrols uh, requiring slave owners to check um, on their slaves that they were in their quarters. You had um, curfews that restricted blacks from being out certain times of the night, um, and especially without their quote unquote owners. You had loitering, anti loitering laws, where in New York, for example, where blacks could gather in no more than three and could congregate in no more than groups of three or else be arrested and subject to criminal arrest and even, even perhaps even worse. Um, you had these laws that were all part of the slave, the slave code and then uh, um, also embedded in the, uh, in the black codes and the Jim, Jim Crow codes of the um, late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, you even saw that as recently as five years ago in, um, in Ferguson, where in the wake of the protests of uh, Michael Brown's killing, um, you had marches. And the police there started to impose this five second rule. And it was a law on the books that said that you could not stop moving if you were in more than a group of five on a public walk. You had to, if you stopped moving for more than five seconds, um, you could be arrested. And so under that rule, under that law, they began to arrest demonstrators if they stood still for more than five seconds. And they arrested up to like 60, 65 people under that ordinance itself, um, saying that people had to keep moving. And if they stopped, um, they would be subject to arrest. Now, it doesn't, it's not a stretch to see or to appreciate how, how um, insidious and how how, how wicked that rule is in the context of, of our history, of context of black history and slave, slavery, right? But here in 2015, this rule was being imposed upon black protests making claims against, um, against the police and against the state um, for the violence. Um, so I think it's um, giving us just a little bit of history here um, and just reminding us of what, what's at stake and what and in some, so many ways, sadly, with regards to policing protests, what we're seeing is not very new at all. So I'll just close it there. And, and yeah. Thank you. So um, I, I wanna turn it over, I guess, um, Claudine was going to um, moderate if we have any Q and A um, in the queue, as well as, I don't know if, um, I, I think folks can still raise their hands as well, if you would rather um, ask the question, um, you know, speak your question. So let me give a minute. Um, I, I don't know that we have any questions currently in the queue. We, we do have one question from YouTube while people are formulating their questions in Zoom. Yeah. Um, and the question is, are there any protections against use of force under the First Amendment or any other amendment? Uh, um, well, we have the Fourth Amendment. Um, um, use of excessive force. Um, uh, uh, and so many, um, in this case, particularly with regards to the um, Seattle protests, that was one of the claims, not only an, uh, that what the police were doing was um, uh, 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 against their First Amendment rights to um, peaceably um, protest, but it was also a Fourth Amendment violation of excessive use of excessive force. And I will, um, one thing I'll add, there's a, there's a very recent case um, that we haven't seen it totally play out. It's just from uh, June of 2018, Lozman versus City of Rare Beach, which um, Supreme Court held eight to one that uh, the police having probable cause is not by itself enough to defeat uh, a lawsuit claiming retaliatory arrest 
uh, uh, on the basis of speech. Um, in that case, the guy is upset about uh, uh, some, some things the local government was doing. He disrupts a city council meeting and he's ordered uh, to be arrested. And it's clear he's ordered to be arrested, not because of the disruption, but because of the content of what he was saying. Uh, and so we may begin to see the development of some law that uh, at least constrains on the margin the ability of police and, and others to use very broad laws, like the law Brian mentioned in Ferguson, like generic laws about disorderly conduct or failure to disperse in a discretionary way to punish those that they, um, that they dislike. My own view is that very clear laws about obstructing traffic and the like, um, Washington DC has laws against defacing public property, uh, are, are fine when they're clear about precisely what it is they are saying is off limits. And when the, uh, whereas things like, you know, failure to, to follow police or, or officer's instruction or this five second rule are so broad that they basically enable law enforcement to decide which people they want to enforce against. And, and so hopefully we will see some development of the law there. Yeah, um, I don't know. I just want to add, um, Jonathan and, and maybe even Jesse could add, um, maybe add a little bit, uh, a tag about qualified immunity and how qualified immunity in 1983 and Bivens figures into all of this. Short answer is, uh, unless you can find a Supreme Court decision exactly on point saying that exactly what the officer did was unlawful, uh, the officer is immune if you try and sue them for violating your rights. Um, and then on top of that, in most jurisdictions, the officer is likely to be indemnified uh, on top of that. So um, mm -hmm. right now, um, police uh, have that sort of protection. Some jurisdictions you know, may, may feel the brunt of liability uh, in the sense that some cities and some police departments pay out um, uh, when there are extreme cases. Um, but it's not clear, at least thus far, that that's had much of a disciplining effect. Mm -hmm. Right, because you have to, you also have to be able to point to an official policy or custom in order to hold the municipality liable, which often doesn't happen when we have the, you know, these, um, or, or which is very hard to do, I guess, traditionally in, in these cases of police violence. And then on top of that, there is the problem that if the officer who has um, harmed you or assaulted you is a federal officer, um, the, the, they're all, all together different and um, harder hoops <laughs> to jump through let's just put it that way, um, to hold uh, federal officers individually liable um, for damages. Uh, I don't know if there's another question. I don't want to take up the time if there are, but I just wanted to ask quickly for um, clarification of Brian, that slide you had up about um, anti-protest laws and the various kinds in the various states, are those things that are being proposed right now or adopted or a mix of those? Some of those, it's a mix. Uh, some of those are already proposed um, and have, are, have already been adopted. Okay. Um, the uh, the ones, particularly the, the hit and kill ones, I, I say I don't I don't think there are those are as prominent, um, or at least those are still being proposed. Um, there were some that were struck down in other states, and what that hit what the hit and kill bills are is they provide immunity to someone who accidentally accidentally runs over or hits a protester. Wow. Um, that, um, uh, yes, yes, that's, that's the long and short of it. Wow. Um, yeah, Thanks. So those laws. So there, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, um, there's, you know, there's, um, there's a West Virginia law that, that, uh, that has been passed. Uh, it's on that slide that, um, that immunizes that, that, um, creates an immunity for police officers who kill someone in the process of quelling a riot or a um, disruptive demonstration. So you, yeah, so you have all of these things going on there. Thanks. Uh, Claudine, are there more questions in the queue? We, we don't have any questions pending, but uh, can I ask a question? <laughs> Of course. Uh, we, we've seen a few instances with these um, protests um, of journalists being caught up in the violence. And I'm just wondering if there are any uh, free speech protections that apply particularly to media coverage. Yes and no. Um, so one, um, the, the doctrine generally and the, the historical understanding of the language of the First Amendment is that speech and press 
are about speaking and printing, um, not about all of us having speech and then a special right for journalists. And if you think about what passed for the media uh, in the late 18th century, that that somewhat makes sense. I mean, you you know, people pamphleteers and you know people printing uh, what were essentially advertising circulars that might have uh, editorials or content or other things um, uh, in the margins. So. Um, it's not that it's journalists or people that are professional journalists so much as it is um, some of this action appears to be retaliation for engaging in protected activity. Uh, and then, um, you know, certain some jurisdictions create processes where they essentially recognize certain people's being engaged in that activity and then, you know, will not will withhold um, or not engage in certain restrictions on them. And it certainly seems that in some cities, at least, those rules have not been observed. Okay. But there isn't, you know, as, as, I mean, if, if, if the police are targeting you because you are engaged in protective con uh, pr protected content, it shouldn't matter whether or not you work for a major national newspaper or you're someone that's taking videos and putting up on YouTube. Um, th th they're, it's both, it's protected either way as it should be, in my view. Brian, did you want to? Yeah, I don't have anything to add to that one, one thing we didn't get to that I would love to, to, to raise, and I, I think it's important um, in terms of how we think about these rights, not just in the Constitution, in the cases, but in terms of actually being lived real rights that people can experience, is um, uh, that relating to the intersection of the First and Second Amendment is that, uh, as we've already talked about, carrying a weapon, communicating that you are capable and willing of defending yourself as communicative conduct, content. Police will often point to the presence of a weapon as a justification for the use of force. So I hope just by noting those two facts, people already can see there's a potential conflict there. And if you think about cases like the Brianna Taylor case, this is the, the case from Louisville, where there's a no-knock raid. And as I understand the facts, her boyfriend um, uh, uh, ha responds the way any law-abiding gun owner would respond if they hear someone breaking into their house, which is to grab their gun and to engage in their right to protect themselves. Their fundamental right, as the Supreme Court has said, to protect themselves in their home. In most jurisdictions in the United States, under the Castle Doctrine, fully within his rights to protect him and Brianna Taylor from uh, what they believe to be a violent incursion into their home. And yet the exercise of that right is then what is pointed to by the police as the justification for the use of lethal force that led to the killing of Brianna Taylor. And that's a problem. Um, and it's a problem as well if it, if it occurs in the context of open protests. If the presence of guns by otherwise peaceful protesters is a justification for the police to initiate force, well, then the, the constitutional right both to express yourself, to express displeasure with the government, and to defend yourself aren't fully, uh, aren't being fully respected. And you know, that's something that I think needs more attention. Um, and that if we expect police um, to be able to use force in appropriate circumstances, but also to exercise restraint, we need to think carefully about how, how police are trained about recognizing actual indicia of violence um, or of threats, as well as um, what it is that the police can and should or should not do uh, that might turn what is the peaceful display of weapons consistent with constitutional rights that all people should be able to enjoy without regard uh, for their race um, into uh, you know, a pretext or justification for police retaliation. Because as we know, um, uh, who is carrying the gun is going to affect and often does affect uh, how police process whether or not they think there is a threat. And if that becomes a justification for police use of force, well then second amendment rights are not in practice enjoyed on an equal basis. And that's something that I think, I just wanted to bring that up because I think that, that's, an, that's an important thing that as a, as a country we have not confronted enough, uh, even though 
there is a long history of of events going back. You know, my favorite or one of the most infamous is the 1967 uh, 1967 when the Black Panthers showed up at the California California State Legislature armed and entered the Capitol building uh, openly carrying arms um, uh, to protest a bill that was going to prohibit open carry uh, in the state. Yeah, the um, yeah the same thing. We we saw that again, or first, not first, but um, also with Philando Castile, and it gets into this issue about whether or not, um, and and whether or not African Americans, Blacks, feel that their right to carry guns is somehow different or less than, or their rights to have them or even possess them um, is somehow less than, and it is something that uh, that becomes a self fulfilling prophecy for police officers to, to use that excuse um, to engage in a sanctioned killing of, 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 of Black people. And, um, and that is something that uh, we saw with Breonna Taylor, we saw with Flando Castile, and so many other instances. Um, that is, yes, that's it, thank you. I, um, I think there's one more question in the queue if you want to um, ask it, Claudine, and I think it might be a good one to end mm -hmm. on. Yeah, uh, so this question is, do we have the right under the First Amendment or other legislation to film police while they are detaining someone? Yes, yeah. although police don't always acknowledge it or recognize it. Uh, generally, you have a right to, uh, there's, not, there's not a Supreme Court decision right on point, but there are uh, decisions in multiple federal appellate courts that say, as long as you are not interfering with the the uh, police conduct, you have a right to record. Um, so, as courts that have understood this, you know, you're standing whatever, ten feet away, fifteen feet away, you are giving enough space for the police to do what they are doing. Um, uh, you are allowed to record uh, their conduct. You know, and then on top of that, uh, increasingly jurisdictions require police to have body cams um, that they wear during uh, their performance of their duties. Although there do seem to be an awful lot of coincidences of those body cams not working at opportune moments. Um, uh, but you do have a right to record. We know that that's not a, um, uh, that right is not always observed, um, uh, but um, it is a right that we all have. You want to either add anything or any last um, no. sentiments to share? No, no, that was uh, that was that was uh, that was a good response. I don't have anything um, better to add to that, um, uh, and nothing to close on. I just think that um, uh, these, uh, you know, we continue to see these these issues of Second Amendment and First Amendment uh, um, come into conflict, um, uh, and particularly with regards to um, protest and demonstration and. And uh, and who's doing a demonstration of what um, what issues are um, at stake here, um, and so um, I, I really I really think that it is, it is time that we've gotten our heads around um, issues of reform around how we think about um, and and, pol and and developing policies on how we um, how how protests are um, policed, how um, how protests are allowed. Um, and um, and more more than anything else, though, just ensuring that um, these rights that um, we purportedly observe, that we purportedly enjoy um, under the First and Second Amendment, are enjoyed by everybody. Um, that's all I I can close on that. I don't know if Jonathan has anything to add. I think you know, just, I, I would agree with all that and say you know, important for folks to educate themselves and and be involved. Yeah. Well, thank you both for contributing to that goal today and for a really fascinating discussion. I know I learned a lot and I thought I knew a lot already about this stuff. So um, so this has been a really um, excellent discussion. Thanks to everybody who's taken the time to attend and to listen and to think about these really important and difficult questions that are not going away anytime soon. Um, so thank you and um, we'll end there. All right. Hi, hi everybody.